Um, so I would like to introduce um, our main attraction here today, which is uh, Luke Manan. Um, Luke is the Lee Simpkins Family Professor of Arts and Sciences and the Ann T. and Robert M. Bass Professor of English at Harvard University. He's been a staff writer uh, at The New Yorker since 2001. His book, The Metaphysical Club, which I'm sure many of you have read, which is a wonderful book, won the 20 2002 Pulitzer Prize for History. And in 2016, he was awarded a National Humanities Medal by President Barack Obama. So we need to ask him about that. Um, his latest book, The Free World, Art and Thought in the Cold War, uh, was praised by the New York Times Book Review as fully original and beautifully written, and by the TLS as elegantly written, entertaining, and bursting with information. It's uh, really an amazing feat, a great read uh, on every level, um, and I, I really, really recommend it. So I'm sure that many of the people here today, Luke, have read your book, but perhaps there are one or two who have not, uh, or maybe haven't finished it yet. Um, and for those in the second group, I thought I would just start out with a really basic question, which is, could you orient them a little bit? Um, what should they know about the book sort of before we launch into this conversation? Sure. Uh, hi, thanks for coming out. <laughs> thanks to my friend Betsy for agreeing to be my interlocutor, and thanks to the festival for uh, inviting me. I had to change my travel plans about five times, so they've been very combinated, <laughs> and I appreciate it. Um, the book is about cultural history between the end of the Second World War and 1965. And the reason it has that frame is because it deals with the first period of the Cold War in which the United States exercised a policy of containment, which was formulated around 1946, 1947, and it lasted until Vietnam. So that, that's the frame of the book. And, uh, but it's not a survey. So what you should be warned about <laughs> is that it's very much street-level stories about the people who produced art, wrote books, published books, uh, produced music, um, had political ideas uh, during this period. Um, most surveys are like at 30,000 feet, and they tend to be encyclopedic in which every important work is named and so forth. I didn't want to do that, partly because of competence, but partly because I find those books kind of boring. So what I decided to do instead was to organize it in chapters, each of which deals with major figure or a couple of figures or a particular movement like existentialism, and then to do a kind of deep dive into that phenomenon and try to explain where it came from, why it latched on, why it was successful, why people talked about it, why you've heard of these people like Jackson Pollock or Jean-Paul Sartre or Susan Sontag today, uh, what, what it was about their work that made it lasting. Um, so it's 18 chapters. Uh, each chapter is like a vertical uh, dive into a particular topic. Um, and they're not consecutive in the sense that they're, they don't follow from one another in terms of the argument or thesis, because the book doesn't really have a thesis in quite that way. But as you read them, you're supposed to get a sense of the world turning. You see what's going on on the street, among these various figures, you see who influences who, what kind of works they produce, what those works mean, and then at the end you get to see a change. And the big change that happens is that the United States moves from being a peripheral player in world culture to being at the center of it. That's really what the story tells. So one of the great um, pleasures for me, am I the one who's humming? Um, Okay, okay. Okay. Is that better? Okay. So one of the really um, fun things about the book, at least for me, is how often it surprised me. There are a lot of, there are a lot of figures you, know, you meet whom you will know something about and you think you know the story behind something. Um, of course, there are many figures I int was introduced to who I didn't know at all. Um, but there are a lot of surprises, things, things that, that, that I thought I knew about, um, but I realized I didn't really know ab about, and I didn't really know the background story. And I'm assuming that the experience of the book was also surprising, surprising to you in, in, in lots of different ways. And I'm wondering if you can 
maybe just give us a couple of examples in your own research of, of, of what surprised you. Maybe, maybe they made the book, maybe they didn't make the book. Um, yeah. We'll take either kind. Yeah, I mean, it's true that uh, all the figures I write about are well-known people. Um, and uh, for people of a certain age, you think you know about these people or you've heard about these people. And then, you know, you find when you do historical research, there's another story there underneath the story that's received. So for me, every chapter was like opening a window in an advent calendar. It's like, oh, there's a story back here. Um, and that's why the book is very long, because I can suck down these rabbit holes. But it's fascinating to sort of realize what it took for these people to do what they were able to do. Um, and it's usually something quite surprising. So you ask for an example. Uh, I'll give you two examples. Uh, one is Jackson Pollock. Um, so I have a chapter on the Aspect Expressionist because that's, of course, the first major American art movement. And it kind of emerges around 1947, 1948. And all the Abstract Expressionists reach their mature styles almost at the same moment. Um, and one of them is Jackson Pollock. So Pollock had come to New York from LA, where he grew up, and gone to high school, to be an artist. And he was very ambitious, but he had trouble breaking into the art world. Part of that had to do with the fact that the world for contemporary American painting was very small. Very few art galleries show contemporary American painting. Very few dealers dealt it. Very few people collected it. So it was a tough market for American painters. People bought European art, and they bought old art. Even the Museum of Modern Art wasn't interested in contemporary American painting right away. So Pollock struggled for a while, and then he married Lee Krasner, also an important abstract expressionist painter. And they moved to Springs on Long Island, which is in the Hamptons, at a time when it was cheap to live uh, in the Hamptons. Uh, and they bought this old house. There was a barn on the property. And the story is that Pollock uh, wanted to paint big paintings, because he'd been interested in painting mural-sized paintings. And the walls in the house were too small to stretch a canvas. So he put the canvas on the floor, and he began painting by throwing paint on. So he used a stick usually. He'd have a can of paint. He'd stick the stick in the can, and he would throw the paint. You've seen the pictures of it, of course. Um, and he liked it. And they converted the barn into a studio, and he had room to stretch a canvas and put it on the wall, but he decided to keep it on the floor. And this is 1947. And for the next three years, or three and a half years, he made the most incredible body of work, I think, in 20th century American painting. They're just incredibly beautiful paintings. They drip paintings. People said, oh, my five-year-old could do that. No, try it. It's really, really hard. He was a real artist, and he just knew how to, he knew how to make this work. He finally stumbled on a form of art that he, could, that he had incredible talent for, really unknowingly, just because the walls were too small to stretch a canvas. Um, so it, it, it's interesting how something that you think of when you think of the history of art as kind of an inevitable result of a certain progression of artistic styles is actually almost purely an accident and yet it becomes iconic. Um, so that's one story uh, that was interesting to me. Um, and a second story has to do with Elvis Presley. Uh, uh, so Elvis Presley uh, went to high school in Memphis, and he always wanted to be a singer. Um, and he liked singing ballads. That was his favorite form of music, and, or gospel. Um, so he went into a little recording studio called Sun Studios in Memphis, which is still there now. It's like a national landmark kind of thing. He went in when he was 18 years old uh, to record a song, supposedly for his mother. So he you could record a song and pay for it, and they would give you the record. They would make a record of it. So he recorded a song called My Happiness, um, which uh, was an old song covered by lots of other artists. And you can still hear it online. It's incredibly beautiful. He had an incredible voice. Um, and he, when he left the recording studio, somebody wrote next to his name on the schedule. People would come in, good ballad singer, keep. So the owner of the studio, a year later, comes across a ballad, and he wants somebody to record it. And he calls Elvis, and Elvis comes in, and they try the ballad, and it doesn't really work very well. So they decide not to do it. Then he says, come back again with a couple musicians. So the guy, his name is Sam Phillips, who runs the studio, invites these two musicians, Scotty Moore, who's an electric guitarist, Bill Black, who's a stand-up bass player, and they come in and they want to record a record. They start with a Bing Crosby song, then they do a ballad, then they do a country song. Nothing's working. They want to go home. And suddenly Elvis starts goofing around. He grabs the microphone, 
and he sings this rhythm and blues song that he just remembered that had been recorded by a black artist named Arthur Crudup called That's All Right Mama. And he's goofing around singing That's All Right Mama, and then Scotty Moore and Bill Black start goofing around too. And Sam Phillips comes out of the control room and he says, that sounds really good. Why don't you go back and start again? And they recorded the song. So that's how Elvis created rock and roll. He later said he'd never sung a rhythm and blues song in his life. He was just goofing around. But it worked, just like the drips worked for Jackson Pollock. So I'm always fascinated by the way in which the things that we think of, as I said, as kind of inevitable, given the shape of cultural history, actually come about in very strange ways. Well, that, that's funny because I my next question was actually going to be to ask you to tell the Elvis story because it's so it's it's such a great story and 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 our sense of inevitability that you know Elvis had to happen and Elvis had to be Elvis. Um, you show very compellingly that Elvis could have been nothing. He could have been absolutely you know a flop, or he could have been something very different right. if someone right. if something else had caught on, um, some other sound and. A lot of, uh, you, you say at one point that a lot of cultural ta change takes place via, quote, random acts of cross-pollination. And I'm wondering, you know, it's kind of, um, it's kind of vertiginous in a way, like if so-and-so hadn't met so-and-so, you know, all of Western, you know, history uh, would be different. Um, but I'm also wondering, like, when you look at the world you know, today, now obviously we'll put COVID aside, we're all, you know, sitting at home, but, but a lot of it did take place, you know, in person, you know, not online, in a kind of serendipitous way. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about, you know, what is happening to cultural production when everyone's uh, basically communicating, you know, over the internet. Yeah, it's very different, obviously, now, because it's all global. Uh, you know, and, and access is very cheap. So uh, you don't have to go to a library to get somebody to read. You just go online and, or listen to music or see a movie or, you know, download this and that. And, 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 it, and it travels around the world very fast. So that's something you see happening in this pre-digital moment just at, at a, on a much smaller scale, more limited scale. So a big part of the story, I think, of American culture between 1945 and the 1960s is immigration, because a lot of people came to the United States, many of them from Europe with the rise of Hitler in 1933, who would not have ever come to the United States if not for Hitler. A lot of the, most of these people who came, the musicians, the artists, the scientists like Einstein, had no interest in America and felt you know, they had nowhere else to go. So they come here, and then they have a profound effect on American thought and American art. Um, and that's, that's also serendipitous in the sense that they wouldn't have had the contact that they had with some of these Americans if they hadn't come over. Um, there's many examples of that in the book. Uh, my favorite has to do with Arnold Schoenberg, who invented the 12-tone system of musical composition. He was Austrian uh, around 1912. Um, and he and his disciples, Weber and Berg, create this 12-tone music, which people call atonal, which is a little bit of a oxymorons. It's, it does have tones. Um, and he comes to the United States in 1933 because of the rise of Hitler, and he's Jewish. And he goes to, settles in Los Angeles, Southern California, where a lot of German emigres actually ended up, like Thomas Mann, uh, Theodore Adorno, and so on. And he ends up there, and he, uh, John Cage is, lives in L.A., and he's a young guy who wants to get into musical composition. And he goes and knocks on Schoenberg's door, and he says, can you teach me 12-tone music? And Schoenberg says, yeah, come on in, I'll teach you for nothing. Um, and that's where John Case begins to get the ideas that lead to his mature avant-garde work. And in particular, believe it or not, it derives directly from the 12-tone system, the silent piece for piano. It's called Four Minutes and 33 Seconds. That's created on 12-tone system, or adaptation of the 12-tone system. So that's another case where Schoenberg and Cage would never have intersected if not for the rise of Hitler. Um, but their intersection had great consequences for American culture. Um, so as, as a lot of these stories illustrate, your, your book is, a, is about specific, you know, John Cage knocks on a door, you know, Western music is never the same. Um, and it seems like that is, one, is really one of the through lines of the, point of the book. You know, things could have turned out very different 
differently. Um, and you say it's not a history of ideas, uh, but an intellectual history, which I have to say was a line I read many times. Um, <laughs> and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you see as the difference and, and about you know, how, this is sort of a more of a method question, how, how you yeah. came to write in, in this particular genre. Um, yeah, and, and why? Yeah, so I, the phrase I use for history of, I use, say it's intellectual history, not a history of ideas. So what I have in mind is that I think of history of ideas, works that are history of ideas as books talking to books. So Kant writes something, Hume writes something, Hegel writes something, Marx writes something, and it's basically a kind of synopsis or story about the text that they produce. So I'm interested actually in the biography of the writer. I want to kind of know the life history of the person who made this work that I'm going to talk about and how that life history found its moment, historical moment, to emerge and to create something that becomes lasting, like rock and roll or abstract expressionism. So for me, it's important to know the bi biographical story. And I think some intellectual historians or history of ideas writers think that biography is not terribly relevant. So I think it's very relevant. The second thing I think is relevant, though, is social conditions. What social forces are operating in the world that create the conditions for a particular kind of music or a particular kind of painting or a particular set of ideas? And, and those have to do with things that are not in the control of individual artists. They have to do with just conditions on the ground, so to speak. So in all my chapters, I try to contextualize what the artist is doing or what the thinker or writer is doing within a larger framework of social change. So one piece of social change we just talked about, which is demographic, which has to do with the immigration, the kind of brain drain of Europe after 1933. That's a big effect on American culture. But there are also other things going on. Obviously, population growth in the United States is important. The rise of the research university and the expansion of the research university is a big story in this period. The rise of the music industry, the diversification of the music industry, changes in Hollywood, uh, changes in the, in the export market, the, uh, the foreign market for Hollywood movies, all those things have an effect on what people are able to do. So I try to capture that as well. So as I say, I, I try to operate on three levels. One is the conceptual level of what's the work about, but the others are the biographical level, which I think of as sort of the on the street level, who's the person, what are they doing, at least to this result, and the third is the social forces, technological, demographic, geopolitical, that shape the possibilities for artists. So maybe this question is, is a bit is a bit meta, but as an intellectual uh, historian, uh, g give us the sort of advantages and and also you know disadvantages of of, of approaching of approaching uh, history this way. No disadvantages. <laughs> <laughs> it's the right way okay, to well do that it. was quick. Okay. <laughs> I think it's the right way to do it. <laughs> okay, okay, we will pursue that. Okay. No, we could pursue yeah, it, right. but yeah, we could pursue it. Yeah. I think that um, uh, the, the, the hard thing to get when you're an historian is this point of intersection between the story of the person and the story of the moment. And you've got to sort of figure out what the story of the moment is that's relevant to that person at that point. It, that, that's, that's the job. Once you've got that in your head, then you could then you can write the chapter. Yeah. But I think it's all upside. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the book t talks a lot about what, you know, we might call or might, might have been called, I don't even know if this term is used anymore in the academy, um, or maybe it never was, high culture, you know, Sartre, Baldwin, new criticism, and also uh, a lot about pop culture. We talk about Elvis, the Beatles play a big role. Um, and so those are, those are two spheres, whatever we're calling them, that are, are very often, even now, treated as distinct, uh, distinct realms with distinct rules. And you seem to be suggesting that, that they're not all that different, you know, that the same sort of rules of cultural production apply, um, and that both pop culture and you know, high culture have an intellectual history. And I, I, I sh I'll first ask the question, you know, is that true? Is, am I reading that correctly? And then the second question is, is if you can talk a little bit about, about that decision, because that does seem, um, that's not usually how intellectual histories are written. Yeah, uh, so that, no, you're right, and that's a good point. 
when we so when we talk about rock and roll, we feel very comfortable talking about it in the context of the music industry because we think of it as a commercial product. So we think about you know how the music industry wants to distribute this particular new sound and who the audience is for it and how they market it and so forth. We don't have a problem with that. We have a problem when it comes to Jackson Pollock. We don't like to think of Jackson Pollock as somebody also is working the art market. But at some level, of course, he is. Um, and his work wouldn't get out there if there was not some infrastructure of art galleries, museum curators, dealers, collectors, and critics who could facilitate his work and get it out to the public. Without those things, there's no Jackson Pollock. So the same rules apply all across the board, high to low. Um, and, I, and I do treat them all the same in that way. I don't think it's debunking uh, Jackson Pollock to say that there was an art market that he was able to take advantage of. I don't think he was a calculating opportunist. I just think it, that's the reality of how he was able to do what he did. And the same thing's true for Elvis Presley. The same thing's true for movies. Um, you know, you have, you, you're trying to think about who the audience is going to be, and then you need a way to get your, good, your work to that audience. Um, in the in the preface of the book, you you talk about how you chose this particular period. So you know, roughly, we're talking 1945 to 1965, um, as you know, not coincidentally, the period when you yourself you know came into this world that shaped you and that shaped your parents, um, and that you were sort of trying to understand them and yourself. And so, to talk a little bit biographically, um, I'm wondering, you know, how that worked. Did you, did you feel like you you had insight into yourself and, and your family? More insight after writing this work? Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not really. Uh, not just an aspiration. Uh, yeah. I was born in 1952, so, and as Betsy said, the book basically ends around 1965. And so I, you know, I knew a little bit about what was going on because of the kind of household I grew up in, but I wasn't, I didn't really understand Sartre or Jackson Pollock or uh, Hunter or Rent or anything, but I you know, knew the names. So, um, so what I say, the part that you're referring to in the preface to the book, is that um, as I was writing the book, I was struck by the degree to which all the figures I'm writing about use the concept of freedom to justify what they're doing, whether they're artists or political thinkers or politicians, whoever. Everybody uses the concept. It's sort of it's the slogan of the times. And I realized when I was a kid, you know, in middle school. <laughs> If somebody said, what's the most important thing in life to you, I would have said, freedom, you know? And I said that, I would have said that because that's all, that's what everybody was talking about, not because I had an original idea of how it was, what was important. So, you know, then you grow up and you go to graduate school and you read, you know, sociology and you think, what freedom, what is that about? And then I thought, maybe going back to this period when this was a term that everybody used would help me understand what it meant to me when I was growing up and what it might mean to me. So that was a little bit of the personal project of the book, and I did get some, I did get some feel for it. Finally, yeah, what what freedom really means. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so also at the beginning of the book, you you write about this period, um, and I'm going to quote you back to you. Uh, Most striking was the nature of the audience. People cared. Ideas mattered. Painting mattered. Movies mattered. Poetry mattered. The way people judged and interpreted painting, movies, and poems mattered. People believed in liberty and thought it really meant something. They believed in authenticity and thought it really meant something. And reading that, I have to say, made me uh, kind of nostalgic for this time, uh, you, know, you know, more or less before I was conscious. Um, it doesn't strike me as something that anyone would write about today, but, you know, write those words about uh, 2021, or, 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 or do you feel differently? I, I guess it could, could yeah. I think it is well, different, yeah, I think it is different. Um, so it is striking when you go back and read through the debates that people had about abstract painting or about popular music and so on, that even the nature of poetry and so on, people really care about uh, which style you liked and which style you didn't like. They thought a lot turned on, on the kind of art that you liked and the kind of art you painted. Um, and I think there's lots of reasons for that. Um, but one reason has to do with the Cold War. Because it was a war of art and ideas as well as lots of other things, of course. Um, and it was self-consciously a war of art and ideas. The two sides, you know, 
engage in sort of cultural diplomacy with one another in other countries. And the United States had to promote a certain idea of its own art. And that idea was the United States is a country when you're free to express yourself. The state does not tell you how to write a poem or how to paint a painting. So everybody knew that there was an official aesthetic in the Soviet Union, socialist realism, and that if you didn't adhere to that aesthetic, you were condemned for bourgeois individualism and aestheticism and so forth, and your work wasn't published or it wasn't exhibited or wasn't performed. Um, so the message the United States wanted to send to the rest of the world is, hey, we're the free world. You know, come join us, and then you can paint any way that you want. So a lot depended, therefore, on the quality and the style of the art that gets produced in that context, because it carries this huge political weight with it. And I think people really internalize that. One thing that people worried about after 1945, and the classic text is George Orwell's 1984, is could it happen here? Could the United States or liberal democracies tip over into totalitarianism? It happened in Germany. Why could it happen here? That's what Hannah Arendt's book is about, The Origins of Totalitarianism. Uh, so the worry was that any step could be a step in the wrong direction. Any step could compromise the value of liberty and lead us into an authoritarian or totalitarian state. Uh, so as I say in the book, it, it, it charged the atmosphere, this way of thinking. So we don't have that now. Because if, let's say, we're in a war with China, it's a trade war. It's not ideological. Nobody wants to go live in China. Right? But in the 1950s, a lot of intellectuals in Western Europe, the United States, I prefer to live in a socialist country. There really was a, there really was a debate about the future, uh, which we don't have now. I would say the big difference between, let's say, 21st century culture and the period we're writing about, one thing we've already talked about, which is 20th century culture is just global. It all passes through New York and LA, right, and Seattle. Uh, and then it goes out across the world and it, tr it travels incredibly fast around the world. Everybody listens to the same music, everybody watches the same movies, everybody reads the same literary fiction. It just gets translated and circulated very, very rapidly. In this period, the same thing is happening at a much, much slower scale, because obviously it's a different, it's different, different media are involved. But the other thing, and the other thing about today is that the cultural horizon seems unlimited. It's just, it seems like it's impossible to know everything that's out there. There's so much stuff out there. Every day I read the New York Times, I read about some pop band I'd never heard of before. You know, that wasn't true in 1965. I'd heard of all the bands before. I have never heard of these bands. Same thing with streaming and you know, everything else. It's like this huge, limitless horizon of cultural products, but it's very flat. It's not like there are these monuments that everybody knows and has to reckon with. That, that's gone. But it's true in this earlier period. There are these important figures that you have to understand. Now it's a much, it's a much bigger cultural world, but it's a much flatter world. So what you just said really brings me to my next question, which is, you know, authoritarianism, the threat of authoritarianism or totalitarianism is really the backdrop of the book. Um, fighting it is what motivates many of the characters, you know, whether they're in government or in the arts, and it's what justifies a lot of, you know, brilliant work, and what justifies a lot of bad shit, and um, when the U.S., you know, quote-unquote, won the Cold War, one might have thought that that struggle was over, but uh, everything old is new again, uh, and here we are at a moment where um, fears of authoritarianism are back, uh, they're back domestically, um, and I'm wondering whether this must have been interesting working on this project at this particular moment and whether you feel looking back at the 40s and 50s and early 60s gives you any insight uh, into what's happening in the U.S. today or has there been some kind of break here? Yeah, uh, so of course I did think about that when I was finishing the book. Uh, I did not predict the election of Donald Trump. <laughs> I don't know anybody who did. Um, and I, I did not predict Brexit. But they were symptoms of something, which is obviously a backlash against globalization, a backlash against neoliberalism, and a kind of resurgence of ethnic nationalisms, which is happening all over the place. And that, it's alarming. I'm not a historian who thinks that history has lessons to teach us because there's so many variables in how things happen. It's hard to hold them all constant while you focus on politics or something like that. So I'm not sure there are a lot of lessons, but it's true that as I was finishing the book, two figures in particular who I talk about in the book came back with a vengeance. One was Hannah Arendt, and her book, Words of Totalitarianism, which was published in 1951, was suddenly on reading lists again after 2016. And the second was James Baldwin, 
Baldwin was a central figure in civil rights era in the early 1960s, and then he gets basically alienated or ostracized. There's a white backlash, liberal backlash against Baldwin, and he kind of disappears from the scene for a long time. Then he comes back with uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates, suddenly Baldwin is a figure again. So it's interesting to see how these figures from 60 or 70 years ago suddenly become relevant again in contemporary politics. So that was that was important to me to sort of see why that was, why they mattered suddenly all over again. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you one more question and then I'm gonna turn it over to all of you. So if anyone has questions or start thinking about them, there are two mics here. Um, but after the, the so end of the book, so we end in sort of the mid sixties, it seems like and you know, maybe I, I'm talking through my hat here, but this is the period, you know, when I myself came of age and there seems like a sort of cultural complacency sets in in the U.S. Um, but now, I would not say that that's true anymore in 2021. Once again, we seem to be in a moment of cultural upheaval that people are once again sort of comparing um, to the 60s. Yeah. And I'm wondering um, if you feel, you know, you have any sense, having immersed yourself in that period, of, um, of why now, why we're seeing this now. and and. Another, th another question, once again, maybe a little bit meta, is, is, is could someone write a book like The Free World about the moment that we're in, or because the me modes of transmission are so much different now, y we're never going to be able to write a book like this again? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've thought about that. I don't have a great answer to it, because probably, because I just feel I haven't studied the contemporary moment in the same way. But it would be hard to name 18 figures who, are, who you would obviously have to write about if you wanted to capture the last 10 years or 20 years. Um, it wasn't that hard to do in this earlier period for some reason. It was a period when individuals could become the face of a particular movement or a particular idea. Um, I don't think that's quite the same now. I don't, know, I don't know why that would be, but it does seem different. I think we're still very obsessed with culture. Um, there are certain issues now that we look to culture to address. They largely have to do with uh, identity issues and who's being represented by who. Uh, those get people very excited. Certainly when I teach students, that's what they want to talk about. It's a different set of issues from the 1950s, but it's very relevant. To me, the big change after 1965 with Vietnam is that culture gets politicized. Before this, it's very much art for art's sake. You know, when John Cage writes the song piece for piano, he, he's trying to create a work of art. Um, when Susan Sontag writes against interpretation, she's trying to focus on style and the sort of sensuous aspects of the artistic experience, not content, not politics. After Vietnam, everything gets politicized and culture gets completely politicized. So we're still living in that moment. So it's quite different in this earlier period. What's exciting about the earlier period, we could say, well, politics is important. Of course, we should recognize that culture has political implications and political effects. But what's exciting about the earlier period is that after 1945, I think people thought, we not consciously, but in some way, people thought the world's been through a Great Depression that lasted 10 years, and then a world war right on top of that that lasted six years. It's time for a fresh start. We just want to turn the page. The Germans called 1945 zero hour. Now, the Germans had very good reason to want to forget that it happened before 1945, but in a way, everybody did, because it was a bad, shitty period in history, world history. So people started saying to themselves, now we can ask, well, what is music? Why is a silent piece for piano music? What is painting? Why, why isn't white paintings, which are just panels painted pure white, why isn't, why isn't that painting? What is poetry? You think people thought they could reinvent the artistic media in which they work. That's a very exciting moment. They could think new things politically, too. They could think, let's think of a different way to reinvent government. So the good part of finishing the book was that I finished it just as Joe Biden was elected, and I thought, we could be at such a moment now. I mean, now I feel a little optimistic at the time, but I think maybe a lot of us felt that way. We could turn the page on a rather bad patch in American history uh, and start over again and reinvent our idea of what American government can do. I think we're sort of trying to do that. That's, that's exciting. So that's the feeling people had in this, in this period that I try to capture in the book. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna Turn it over to to our audience. So, uh, Jacob, please start us off. Um, uh, Luke, in this period, uh, you write about um, the U.S. government.
promoted cutting edge American culture both openly and clandestinely. Um, and I wonder what your verdict is on the cultural Cold War um, in the sense, was it ultimately productive and valuable for the arts in the United States? And if you want to get into it, was it an effective strategy in fighting the Cold War? Yeah, thank you. Uh, <laughs> so this is a big can of worms. Uh, and as you all know, because um, there's a lot that's been written about it, the CIA had a covert, among its many covert operations, was one that funded uh, various cultural groups and a lot of political groups as well. Uh, and this started around 1950 um, and uh, lasted until about 1967, which is when it all blew up. It blew up because Ramparts Magazine, which was this kind of slick muckraker, uh, discovered that or learned that the CIA had been funding something called the National Student Association. Basically, it was created their whole international program covertly. And it swore the students who were involved in the association to secrecy with the threat of 20 years in prison if they ever told anybody the CIA was involved. And finally, somebody did. And it all blew up. And when that blew up, it turned out the CIA had been behind all these apparently non-governmental, privately funded organizations, from the Voice of America to the Cult Congress for Cultural Freedom to these little magazines in Europe, like Encounter, which was a London magazine. The editor of Encounter was a CIA agent. Every important intellectual in the United States wrote for Encounter. Everyone, Baldwin, Dwight McDonald, the Trellings, you know, everybody. And then when it all comes out, they're like, wait a second, we were being paid by the CIA for this? It's a huge crisis. Um, so, so that's a story that's been told now a bunch of times. And I think there's a lot of stuff about it that's misleading. I have to say, when I started writing my book, which is a long time ago, I thought that would be a big theme of the book. It turned out not to be that important, actually. I don't think that it's true the CIA was funding all these different organizations covertly, but it didn't have that much effect, really, on what people chose to do, what people chose to paint, what people chose to write about. Um, it, uh, so, that's, so that surprised me a little bit. And then the most commonly heard story about CAA funding is that it promoted abstract expressionism. There's a whole literature on this that goes all the way back to like 1972. Um, and it's not true. There's no evidence the CIA thought anything about abstract expressionism. <laughs> because it was not in the interest of the American government to promote one style of art for the reason I already gave, which is that the propaganda message was we tolerate all styles of art. Not we have an official style called abstract expressionism. So it's just not the case that the CIA promoted it or the Museum of Modern Art promoted it as a way of sort of, of form of cultural propaganda. Uh, but that's the story that's the story that's out there. Uh, I, in the book I try to give the archival details that show that this is the case. So I don't think it I don't think it had that much of an, an effect. Um, you know, you could say sort of at the margin, certain things might not have happened without CIA funding. So one example is they supposedly gave some funding to Partisan Review, which was a left-wing anti-communist journal uh, in the 40s and 50s. But there's actually no concrete evidence that that happened. But if they did, they kept Harvard's Review alive. That, you know, that had consequences. Uh, but I found that you have to tread carefully when you talk about that part of this story. I talk about it a lot in the book. I mean, to try to tell what happened. But I don't think it had that much influence. You know, what influence, what were persuaded people in the United States was had a great culture was rock and roll and Hollywood movies. You know. yeah. It was a Lionel Trellin. <laughs> I guess I'll, I'll switch mics. Okay. Uh, my question is related to the interface between the, the fact that the U.S. was at its zenith of power in the post-World War II era and the, and the artist that you describe. And my question is, would Elvis have been a wonderful Delta Blues singer who wasn't heard anywhere else, or would Jackson Pollock have been an eccentric on Long Island if we had not been the United States and the most powerful nation in the world at that point? And, and how do you play those yeah. two issues? No, a huge part of the story is the, is the dominance of the United States both as a military power and as, a, uh, as an economic powerhouse. Um, I don't have the statistics at the top of my head, but you know, we, we produce most of, the, most of the world's oil, we produce 80% of the world's cars, we had most of the world's gold. I mean, we just, you know, we're at this powerhouse. And then the other thing to remember about this period, 
from 1950 to 1973, roughly, uh, there's enormous world growth. So the uh, average domestic growth rate worldwide in that period is 4.9%. That's fantastic growth. The United States isn't even at 4.9%. Everywhere, Warsaw Pact countries, South America, uh, you know, sort of poor countries like Austria and Spain, uh, as well as the Western democracies in the United States. So there's this kind of feeling like the pie just keeps growing. And when you're in a world where the pie just keeps growing, you can act social programs, you can try new kinds of art, you can, you know, you, you just feel you have the money to make it possible for all kinds of things to happen that you probably wouldn't have been able to support in a different era. Then after that, and also the other thing about the period is that it's a period of record low gap in income and wealth. So the gap between top earners and the middle class is the smallest in world history in this period. And it all changes after 73, it starts going the gap starts increasing again to where we are today. Um, so it's just an unusual period economically, and that's a really important part of understanding how these art worlds manage to diversify and expand and be so incredibly creative. I want to take it back to the writing life. Uh, I'm a little older than you. I was 20 in 1965, and I've been reading The New Yorker for about six years. And I can't imagine my professors at, at Harvard, E.B. Uh, uh, B.J. Whiting or Herschel Baker, writing for a popular audience. Nor can I rem imagine James Thurber uh, or E.B. White uh, teaching at Harvard. <laughs> There's this new phenomenon represented by you and uh, Jill Lepore, and the interesting thing is that all your work is extremely successful. Every book you've ever written if we take the lowbrow view, uh, uh, Amazon readers have averaged four or four and a half stars. But all of your academic work has garnered an average of 13 reviews, while your reviews of your two books, The Metaphysical Club and Free World, have garnered an average already of 230 reviews, and this one's just getting launched. My question is, Double twofold. Number one, what do you think has caused this phenomenon in the integration of academe and uh, popular culture? And number two, how do you see your work? For example, when you wrote your book on modernism and T.S. Eliot, or just another book of one figure, how do you see the differences that you have to make in your thinking, your point of view? How did you come to be the popular writer you are without abandoning being the intellectual writer you also are? Well, thank you. Uh, and I mean, no, it's a good question. And I, the only thing I can say is that this is just the way I write. Whatever, whatever I write, I write the same way. I don't think of the free world as a popular book versus an academic book. It's just the way, it's just the way I tell a story. Um, and I think that I've been incredibly fortunate that the way I write is just commercial enough for me to have a magazine career and just scholarly enough for me to be a professor. <laughs> so I, I just feel I just somehow managed to get the, there's a tiny Venn diagram overlap, but I'm in that overlap. Um, I, that's the best I can, answer I can give. It, so I guess I'm saying at no point did I say, now I want to be a popular writer. I'm going to write a different way. Just that's the way I do it. I think the same is true of Jill. She just, that's the kind of writer she is. Um, I would want this book to be a book that specialist scholars learn from or, or argue with uh, and take seriously. But I also want it to be a book that people who don't know anything about the subject or know a little about the subject will read and enjoy. And, and that's what The New Yorker is about. That's what The New Yorker View Book is about. That's, you know, that's the kind of writing that I do. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for keeping tally of my... <laughs> <laughs> Yes, please. Hi. Hi. Uh, look, I haven't read your book yet, so this is sort of, I, I'm, I'm asking my question without knowing exactly, you know, what you say in the book, but I'm wondering, first of all, the, 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 the expression, the free world, I mean, do you sort of question that or problematize it at all or sort of say, okay, is, is, what, what's going on? Who is, whose word is this? Whose expression is this, the free world? And, and this is linked to my other question, which is, um, 
the, the end point. In other words, uh, I, I, I guess your book ends around 1965 right. or just about that, which is just around the time that the Vietnam War was getting That's started, right? right? So right. really, really getting, yeah. getting, and all the anti-Vietnam demonstrations yeah. and everything else, which I remember, I was at Harvard as a graduate student, so, uh, and going to, you know, uh, to just marches and whatever. Yeah. So is, uh, is your book a kind of, I'm wondering, is it, celebrating the triumph of the free world, which then begins to be really uh, eaten away with Vietnam, yeah. where people are saying, what the hell? You know, the United States is just a, uh, is, is really engaging in atrocities, just like everybody else. So anyway, this notion, uh, what do you, you know, do you sort of um, uh, pose it at some point as a, as a question? Yeah, I do. it's a question. So I don't have, I don't judge it. Uh, but you, you, without reading the book, you manage to encapsulate exactly <laughs> what the shape of it is. It starts, in, it starts after the Second World War with the policy of containment, which is the policy of keeping communism in its box. And that policy hits a crisis point in 1965 when we intervene militarily in the war in Vietnam. And, uh, and that's a crisis for containment because George Kennan, who's the author of the, author of the policy of containment, He's called before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in 1966, and he's asked, is this what the policy of containment mandates the American government should do, which is to send troops to prevent North Vietnam from taking over South Vietnam? Is that what you had in mind back in 1946 when you formulated this doctrine? And he couldn't answer the question, because it's hard to answer that question. If we're trying to keep communism in its box, we have to stop North Vietnam at the 17th parallel. That's, that's our mission. But that involves committing troops and losing lives, and that's not something that, or, that, that Kennan had really thought about. So that's why it ends there. And as you say, the result of that debacle of our seven-year, eight-year involvement in this war of independence in, in, in Southeast Asia was that the United States went from being the champion of the free world in 1945, where it, when it led the fight against fascism, and when it helped to rebuild Western Europe and Japan, various largesse all over the world, all that political capital that we accumulated, we burned through in Southeast Asia. Um, and we became labeled as an imperialist power, exactly where we didn't want to be in 1945. All right, I think, no, we have one more question. Okay, I, I, do we have time, anyone? Yeah. Okay, we can take one more question. Thank you. Hi, I just wondered, I'm really interested in this idea of serendipity. Because in the arts we talk about the happy accident, where you have an accident and you have a great discovery. But I wonder both on the micro level of that and the macro level of like these incredible moments happening with John Cage and Schoenberg, is there, besides the serendipity, is there also a cultural force, or you could argue a zeitgeist, whatever you want to call it, there's, there's an underpinning or a, an energy, or is that way too no, no, no. new age? Yeah. No, 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 <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, that's a great... Thought, and I, I guess I would put it this way. Um, so there are several examples in this period of what uh, people think of as a spont spontaneity or spontaneous way of making art. One is the drip paintings. Another one is uh, Jack Kerouac's novel On the Road, which he's typed on a continuous scroll of paper. Um, and I think Kerouac even called it spontaneous composition, unfortunately. Uh, but as I said, it's very hard to make a painting by throwing paint on a canvas. It's really hard. Um, and it's also very hard to write a book when you can't go back and erase anything. That's really hard. It's a discipline. Um, the same thing's true of jazz solos. It's really hard to play a jazz solo. It sounds spontaneous, but you have to you know, know the changes and you know, all the rest of it. So a lot of the stuff in the period that seems sort of free form is actually the same thing's true of the silent piece for piano. There's a score for that piece. There's actually a score with the measures all laid out for how it's to be performed. There's no notes on the score, but there's, but there's, you know, there's a, there's, uh, there's, there's, you know, there's lines for, for notes. So all those things involve a certain kind of discipline. The discipline comes probably from what I think you're tr trying to get at. It was very hard to, for an historian to uh, describe, which is the feeling that this is a moment when this kind of thing could happen. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's what you're. And I don't know where that comes from. You know. It's just in people's heads, they're like, oh, let's try this. Um, one of my favorite examples, and we'll stop, 
of this is uh, is Robert Rauschenberg's uh, stuff, the goat stuffed goat with a tire around it. So you probably all know this piece. It's an Angora goat, stuffed goat, that he bought at an office supply store downtown in Manhattan. Uh, because every office needs a stuffed goat. Well, <laughs> so it turned out the guy who owned the office supply store had bought a box at an auction, you know, a storage box, and the goat was in the box. <laughs> so Rauschenberg, this is 1954, had no money. He goes into the store. How much do you want for the goat? The guy says $35. Rauschenberg says, I'll give you 15 He never went back and paid the rest, which is unfortunate because it's probably now worth about $100 million. And so he had this goat. He had this stuffed goat. It's about, you know, it's about this big. And in his studio. He didn't know what to do with it. And he tried it in various, so he was making what are called combines, what he called combines, which are three-dimensional collages, basically. So he'd have a stuffed animal and a pair of shoes and something from the newspaper and so on, all kind of put into this three-dimensional collage. And he, his principle, of, his artistic principle was nothing can be the center of interest. Everything has to be treated, every element of the painting has to be treated equally. So the problem with the goat was that it's very hard to make a work of art in which the goat is not the center of interest because it's an amazing thing. He finally solved it by putting a tire around the goat because now it's, e it's either about a tire or about a goat, but it's not about a goat. Um, and this solved the problem for him. So when you see it, you don't quite know what to make of it, but when you realize there actually is a sort of idea about what art should be that he shared with Cage, everything should be treated equally, nothing should be the tonic or the centerpiece, uh, nothing should be at the center. Um, as John, John Cage once put it, when they, he performed a multimedia thing with Morris Cunningham, who was his partner, was a dancer, a choreographer, a bunch of artists at Black Mountain College. It was in a setting like this, and people came in and wanted to watch the show, and they said, where's the best seat? There's no best seat. Every seat is different. So every seat is equally good. Um, and that, that's, that, so that's, an, that's a zeitgeist idea, right? Um, and it makes it possible for certain things to um, thank you all. Thank you, Luke. Thank you. thank you all for coming.